Welcome to the Agent of Wealth podcast with Mark Boudis from Boudis Financial. In this podcast, Mark helps guide you towards financial freedom, ensure you never run out of money, and create a balance in life that prioritizes what is most important to you. Join us for this journey as Mark draws from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the multiple wealth building challenges involved in your financial life. Welcome back to the Agent of Wealth. This is your host, Mark Bowdis. On today's show, we brought back on the Bowdis Financial Team to talk about the book Stacked, uh, your super serious guide to modern money management. So we have John Williams, Kira Mackesy, and Kayla Waller on. So on our last podcast episode that we released, I interviewed Emily Guy Birkin, who along with Joe Saul Sahi, they're the co-authors of the book um, that I just mentioned, Stack, your super serious guide to modern money management. So in preparation for the interview with her, I actually read the book and I thought it would be a good one for us to cover as part of our book club. You know, we all looked at a lot of personal finance books and, you know, some of them are really numbers oriented. Some of them are really dry. Some of them are really good. I thought this one really explained, you know, even though it covered a lot of the basic topics, a lot of topics that, you know, people think about when it comes to personal finance, I thought they did a really good job including stories about each of the topics. And then also what you really rarely see is they included humor. You know, we each read the book and one of the kind of assignments on how we wanted to cover this was let's pick our favorite and the book's obviously broken up into chapters for financial topics. So let's each cover, you know, one of these areas and really talk about kind of how they explain the topic, how they cover the topic, and then what someone could learn from that. Kayla, we'll start with you. And I think your favorite was debt. Yeah, the chapter I like the most is called Debt or Driving a Moped Down a Dirt Road to Hell. And in that chapter, they talked about two different methods for paying off debt, the snowball method and the avalanche method. Before you start, you know, I was I was talking about how they use humor in the book. And instead of like co-writing each chapter, they each took chapters and alternately wrote them. And then I guess checked each other's on the chapters they didn't write. But um, I love the way that they introduced debt. They talk about college and having these credit card companies set up shop on college campuses and didn't really say it this way, but essentially preying on college students to give them credit cards. And then what they said is that at one point, the government passed or issued this credit card act of 2009, which made it illegal for credit card issuers to set up shop a thousand feet from a college campus. And all I thought of like is growing up and you're at like an elementary school and you see that sign about drugs close to a school. And then you kind of think about it and I guess, all right, credit cards, drugs, there's some equivalent equivalent there, but <laughs> yeah, there's like signs on the side of the road that say uh, a credit card free zone. Yeah. Drive into them. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they definitely did a good job with some of the humor on this, but yeah, Kayla, like, I guess how could a debt avalanche or a debt snowball help someone that went into debt? The snowball method, you start with paying off your smallest debt first, and then once that is gone, you move towards the next smallest and so on and so forth. A lot of people like this method because it gives you a win early on, and it makes you feel like you're making progress towards paying down your debt. And it just kind of like helps you gain momentum because it takes discipline and time to get out of debt, and this might help you stick to it. Another consideration with the snowball method is even though you're paying down the smallest balance is the quickest. It's not really taking math into account because you're not considering the interest rate on the loan. So you may have a low interest rate with one loan and then a high interest rate like a credit card that's just accumulating and growing as you're focusing on something that has a relatively low interest rate. John talks about this a lot when we talk to people about, and he uses an example of paying off a mortgage. Right. And he talks about, yeah, we can look at the math behind it and look on whether it makes sense to pay it off or not. But sometimes there is an emotional attachment or a psychological attachment to being debt free. And in this case, it's something similar because you're talking about, well, maybe the, there's a way to pay off the debt in the most efficient or most, you know, in the way that you'll pay the less interest. But in this case, getting those small wins can help. And when I was reading this, I thought of the first book we reviewed on here, Atomic Habits. And that whole book, the whole concept is getting small wins to make big changes over a period of time. So yeah, even though it may not be the most efficient way of paying interest off, you, you want the one that someone's going to stick to. So I could definitely see this one being useful. Yeah. And then the avalanche method is similar to the snowball method, except that it's taking the interest rates into account. So you're starting by paying the loan with the highest interest rate first. 
you're just allocating the money towards paying down the, the highest rates the quickest. An advantage of this method is that you're paying the least amount of interest over the term of all of the loans because you're paying down the loans with the highest rates first. Another consideration with this method is that the emotional component, like we were just talking about, yes, it makes the most math to pay down the loans with the highest interest rate first, but it, for some of these loans, it could potentially take months or even years to pay off. So it, it might feel discouraging to be working on that and just seeing your other debt still exist. So this one is probably for the person who's very disciplined, who can really stick to the plan over maybe a longer period of time. But by doing it, this is this would be the way that they'd pay the, the, the least amount of interest in their debt payoff. Yeah. And then another good point that I think this chapter makes is that to avoid getting into debt in the first place, you need to understand how, how much you're making and how much you're spending and just realize that a lot of people don't know that. But taking the time to break down and see where your money's going and then budgeting into different categories, putting some into savings, some into retirement, and then developing a spending plan can be really helpful to avoid going into debt. And then one quote that I liked from the end of the chapter was that it has to make mathematical sense and be personally satisfying. Mm -hmm. I think what happens a lot, and I guess it depends on, on the person, but for whatever reason, they may have gotten into debt. Maybe let's say they set up a plan to use one of these methods or any, any method to pay off their debt. How do they prevent from going back into debt? Because I'm sure probably those habits over a longer period of time of utilizing debt are there, are still going to be there. And you know maybe it's something that triggers them to, to go back into debt. But does he give any tip in terms of once you're out of debt, how to make improvements or, or change your habits or lifestyle so that you don't actually don't go back into debt? Yeah, towards the end of the chapter, it was just explaining how to develop different budgeting tools to learn where your money is going. When you know where your money is going, it's easier to not overspend more than you have. Yeah, it can almost equate it to like someone trying to lose weight or going on a diet where the temptation is always going to be there to uh, rehash or, or go back into that. That They use a an example of, they say, one of the ways you can prevent it is get a, a, life, a life-size cutout of your most disapproving friend, they say, oh, put a little speech bubble that says, do you really need that? Um, and it's a good point to kind of think about whenever you make a big purchase, you know, take a second. And sometimes people say, take a longer period of time to just think about it. Does it make sense? Is it something you need? And then obviously if you do, but at least it prevents some of those, you know, rash kind of decisions where the, you purchase something on the spur of the spur of the moment. So the next topic, John, which part of the book did you, you find most interesting or most uh, useful? I guess it's just my insurance background. I always find this stuff fascinating just because I, I had so much time with, with insurance. Let's just be honest. It's not like a fun topic. And, and a lot of our, the insurances that we deal with are, are necessary and some aren't. And there's just like this mindset and approach to, to, to insurance that I find very interesting because everybody is different in the way that they look at risk. Obviously, we talk a lot about risk and it's, it's very much the same. So I, I really li like the, their approach with this, um, the, what they call insurance bingo is the, uh, was the name of the chapter, which at first I was waiting for it to kind of come together as a game of bingo. It's not bingo at all, right. which uh, maybe that's part of the, the, <laughs> the yeah. joke. So, you know, obviously everyone here has probably played bingo and, and there's a, a letter and a number and then, yeah, but this is more like a point system, but a good one. I thought, you know, a, a way for you to kind of score yourself and understand how, how protected you are and how the different areas and the different areas where you can be insured or have protection um, lend to like a, a big picture as far as like how well you're doing, almost like a report card. Yeah, I, I like the gamification of finances mm -hmm. and insurance particularly. And, you know, like that exercise of going through all the different, and they, they list some of the questions on what to think about it in terms of insurance, or do you have this, or you get extra points if you do that. But we all need motivation to do some of these things. And, you know, maybe looking at that as an exercise of going through auto, homeowners, disability, life, and then like an umbrella policy. So like, keep it simple because... Like you said, the insurance you know, industry, I think you called it interesting. I, I think you can take it a step further and call it complex and confusing a lot to a lot, of, a lot of people. And it's one of those things where you pay the premium, you hate paying the premium, but if you ever need it, you're glad that you have, you have that, that insurance. So you know, it's definitely uh, an area that's, that's important. Did they give any tips in terms of any of those areas of, of what to do to really improve your situation with insurance? Yeah, I mean, I also, I like the way that within each category, topic, area of insurance, they gave a little story. 
it, I think that really makes it easier for you to digest and understand and just kind of hear an example of, because if you've never been through something like, for instance, you know, car insurance, I think is a, is a perfect one. We all have, if we're driving, we have to have car insurance, you know, it's a law. Um, where as opposed to life insurance, it's, it's, it's a personal choice and, and you know, obviously it's not something you have to buy. So when we do go find ourselves in those situations, I think we're tempted to find the cheapest without understanding what you're actually choosing. You just say, oh, I'm not making enough that much money. I need to make sure that I'm pick the lowest possible, you know, the lowest possible amount. But really, I think the key takeaway from all these different areas at the highest level is just take a second to understand what you're signing and what you're doing. Back to the car insurance, like if you got into an accident, understand that like if somebody got hurt, what, what would that look like? If someone sued you for a half a million dollars or a million dollars, you know, what would that situation look like? And then use that example to apply to what your current coverage is and, and you know, kind of try to put yourself in, in the shoes of yourself in that situation and say, hey, is this where I want to be? And then look at the other options and, and compare you know, that scenario, because sometimes with, with car insurance, the biggest one really is going to be those, that liability factor. And that ties into the umbrella part of it too. But, you know, we're tempted to just save money. You know, that could be an extremely costly mistake, you know, in the long run. I thought the, the examples did a good job of helping the, the, the reader or the listener understand what the implications could be for those, those types of decisions. Yeah, I think because, like you said, it's, it, you know, we like to save money. And also, I think sometimes we become paralyzed by all the options that are out there on these insurance policies that we just kind of say, you know what, I'm just going to ignore it for and then it's probably the wrong decision. And we should all approach it like what you said is just start with that high level question. What would happen, you know, if this happened, how does this impact me? If I died and my income is gone, how will my family move forward? If I become disabled and I can no longer work? How you know will it pay expenses from in a car accident if my home burns down and you know those are all at least you start with that and then you know drill down into the complexities of the insurance and and try and figure out what you uh, what you need I thought I thought one of the things that he mentioned on the uh, homeowner side is take a video of all of your belongings yeah, yeah and I had that written down because I thought that was a really really great idea from that example you know, get robbed. Um, there's a fire. It's a mess to try and figure figure that stuff out. And um, if you have this this video that you could just re, um, point, and he even tapes it a step further. Is like you know, make sure it's somewhere that you know if the house did burn down, right. God forbid, that you it's on the cloud or you know it's not like you know on a recorder. Pretty easy these days. Obviously, most yeah. most of the stuff that we have is on the cloud. But I think his point is is like make sure that something real easy like that, you know, in in a situation. Uh, a really bad situation because if you're pulling for that video, if something bad happened, um, yeah. that you know you at least make it make it easier and, and you can uh, submit a claim and, and and get some relief as quickly as possible. Yeah, and the other thing I, I, I kind of resonated that he mentioned, he, you know, he started off talking about disability insurance, which it's aptly named the forgotten insurance, but he starts it off by saying dif- disability coverage is a must. Um, you know, and what he does is he gives the example of how many more times during your working career you're likely to become disabled than you are actually dying. When we see it even on our sides, people focus more on the life insurance. They have children, they say, oh, let's get life insurance, but they don't think about the disability. It is now priced based on the likelihood of it happening. So it is more expensive than life insurance is usually, but it is something that does happen. And you know, if it does happen, you want to make sure that you can prepare for it. And, and as an advisor, it's, it's hard. And that's why I appreciate that, like this chapter, because I feel like, you know, just any way that people can try to understand insurance and the way it works and, um, you know, and the likelihood of something happening, I think is, is really important because as, as an advisor, you don't want to feel like you're like pushing or selling something that it really is truly important, but it is, you know, the, the, the risk is, is definitely there. And, uh, you know, I think that they do a good job of making people maybe reconsider even started this off with a lot of people don't get insurance because they're trying to cut costs. One of the, the things that they talk about in the book is you can do that by having a beefed up emergency fund. So when we can use disability insurance as an example, you know, most people purchase the policy um, and their disability insurance kicks in after, let's say 90 days, and it's priced based off of 90 days. But if you extended it to, let's say you had an emergency fund and you can you know, you can pay your expense. If you became disabled, you can pay your expenses for 120 days or even a full year. And you didn't have to have that disability insurance kick in, you know, after 90 days or sometimes even sooner, you would save money on the premiums because the insurance company is pricing the fact that, you know, you may get disabled, but it may not last 
as, as long. So, you know, having that emergency fund, it's, it's good for a lot of different reasons. One of them is it could potentially lessen the, um, the cost of your insurance. Premiums. Yeah. You can extend that out sometimes I've heard as far as like a year, yeah. you know, that elimination period. And it does significantly change that. And, and that's really where this whole conversation has to start at this happened, forget about insurance, just have the conversation. If this happened, how would you cover it? And then I think it's kind of starts that conversation because if, let's say if you're somebody who is, is, has a, a lot of assets and you look at your situation and you have the money, whether you, whether it's an investment account or in cash, where you could cover yourself for whatever the, you know, the, the disability, basically self-insure, yeah. then um, obviously, you know, you're in a different spot than somebody who would be bankrupt within, you know, a few months. So yeah, no, I thought I thought it was interesting. <laughs> I was yeah. kind of curious, curious ask, ask him about like what the what the bingo bingo part right, part right, of it yeah. was. But but at the end, you know, you tally up all all, all these. You know, give yourself a score on all these insurances, and then you can kind of give yourself this like nice report. And if you score low, like maybe you circle back and try to try to work on some of those different areas. But I, I think that like you said, like the gamification or like the the process that the, the approach they have is very simple. And like it gave you a result that right. you kind of, you know, kind of gauge yourself Thanks against. Mark on. Yeah. All right. So Kira, next we're on to you. What was your favorite topic or area of the book? I um, covered credit, which is similar to Kayla's section of debt. I just remember being in high school when my parents suggested that I got my first credit card. Um, it was around the time of graduation from high school to college. So I qualified for a student credit card and I remember like holding the shiny yellow Wells Fargo credit card in my hand. Um, it was exciting, but perceptions of money and ideas of like what's right and wrong as a young adult comes from the people that we surround ourselves with and for most people then your parents. And my mom and dad must have really spooked me because I only made one purchase on that credit card the entire first year I had it. I remember I scheduled like the full payment before the transaction had even posted. So I was really spooked in using it. And um, in this chapter, it's written by Joe. He tells like a very different story of his introduction to credit. He basically was at military college. He got a credit card and he made stupid little purchases like a new sweater. He picked up lunch for him and his buddies. And he didn't even realize that the money had to be paid back. Um, yeah. So he ended up screwing up his credit. He had to pay collections. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest added to the purchase that is like way more than if he would have just purchased it with cash or debit. Um, and you can tell that his experience really impacted his perception of credit, like of this chapter. So he actually shares in this chapter a table that shows how he shifted his perceptions of credit. So on the left side of the table, it reads, credit was my crutch. Credit was for allowing me to keep up with my friends and credit extended my lifestyle. And then on the right side, he sort of reframes the thought processes that he used to have. And it just shows you how you can think of credit in a way different way. So instead of credit is my crutch, it reads credit is a tool. Instead of credit was for allowing me to keep up with friends, it reads credit allows me to increase my ability to profit. And instead of credit extends my lifestyle, it says credit expands my reach. That was good how he put like the positive way to look at credit versus, you know, what some people, and I, I found a couple of things kind of, um, the, he, like you said, like you, just like you got a, a card in college. I got one in college. He got one in, in college, but what he does, he talks about how credit works and what goes into your score. And ironically, one of the things is how old is your credit? which would lend itself to say that it's probably a good idea, you know, as soon as you can get a credit card to get it, because that's one of the things that helps build up your credit score. But then on the flip side, you have to be responsible with that, like you are with, with how you use it, unlike how, how he was. So he talks about like how the score is determined. And that is, that's one of the like five factors. It's like what you just mentioned, how old is your credit, but also do you pay your bills on time? How much credit do you have available? And how much are you already using? What's your credit mix? And have you applied for a lot of credit lately? And he goes into detail on like each of these points. And um, you can also find, you know, a lot of this information online elsewhere as well. But in having like a conversation about credit, by far the most asked question is how can you improve your credit? Because even if your credit is not necessarily bad, um, the ideal goal is to have, you know, the best credit possible. It gives you access to a lot of things. 
in life, even if it's just like applying for an apartment or a house, and also how can you avoid interest? So the tips that they give is sign up for automatic payments of the minimum amount on your card. This way you don't avoid any missed payments. Whenever you get an alert, use it to pay even more um, because additional payments are the only way to significantly pay down your debt. And then when credit card companies offer you more money, you can take it if you think that you can trust yourself because that expands that ratio of how much credit you have available to how much you are already using. So that you know comes with the caveat of don't use all that extra credit that you're being offered. And then keep your oldest credit card open so that that college credit card, definitely keep it open. And then also just keep in mind that these tips don't really apply to like the credit all-stars that pay off their cards in full every month and avoid interest because that is the ideal way to go, but not everyone can realistically make that happen. Yeah, I, I saw that. That was the first thing I thought of when I when I saw um, his first tip of, of like improving your credit was, you know, set up automatic payments to pay the minimum. And my first thought was like, no, strive to to pay everything, you know, strive to to not have to pay interest. You know, you look at a credit card and the interest that you pay on your on your credit card is probably one of the worst ways to to deaden your money that are that are out there. But mm-hmm. you also have to realize it's not easy for someone to flip a switch and say, okay, they have this much credit card debt and all of a sudden they're going to pay the, start paying off their bills in full. It, it really needs to kind of have some kind of like measured plan to, you know, even like what we were talking about with Kayla to go from, okay, having credit card debt, or that's also one of the things you mentioned too, is it's the mix of, of credit that impacts your score too. Like if it's just credit card debt, not so good, but if you have other types of of debt, it's I guess looked at more favorably, whether that's student loans, a mortgage, or some other types of of loans. And then the other thing that I, I was thinking about the where you just said, you know, if a if a credit card company offers you an additional increase in your limit, take it. But then it's like goes back to the getting the credit card in college, and it's like you have to be responsible again if you do that, and not just look at that as a way to like fill it up with some you know purchasing something to fill up that gap. So looking at all that, you can see how people get into trouble with credit because it's almost like the credit card company is playing this game where where they want you to use credit, they want you to pay interest, but they don't want it to get to the point where it overwhelms you and you like cry uncle and quit and say, all right, I can't pay this off anymore. So it's this big game that that is out there that, you know, like, like you said, the ideal situation is credit's a tool, use it, but pay it off each, each and every, every month. One of our most popular podcast episodes where we're John interviewed a credit repair specialist, Nicole Violet. So there's definitely a lot of people who are in that situation where, you know, they want to know what they can do to improve their credit because it's so important. Everything, you know, that a lot of things that are tied, you're tied to you financially revolve around what your credit score is. So it's like this sacred number that you want to just make sure at any point it's as high as possible because it will definitely impact, you know, different things that you do financially. One of my favorite parts of the book was on goal setting, just because I'm kind of fascinated about how all these different authors or people, you know, we do it a lot too, talk to people about their goals. But one of the things that Emily suggested is timeline your goals. Um, Because when you, you know, we'll talk to someone and we'll say, what are your goals? What are you trying to do? What's important to you? And they might rattle off a couple of things. They might rattle off 10 things. Or, you know, some people rattle off a lot, but you really want to look at and see, well, when are all these, because they're not all probably something that you want to do in, in the same amount of time in five years or 10 years, there might be different things. You might have something you want to do tomorrow, something you may want to do next year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Um, and she talks about timelining goals. And then you can just see, it's another visual to just get a, a you know, a, a feeling around or a feel for your finances and, and where you are with them. So the goal chapter was my favorite. I like that exercise too, because I think a lot of people have financial goals, but then they don't actually think about when they want to achieve them. So like, for example, I would love to buy a house someday, but I have no idea when that would be. But when you actually set a goal and timeline it and make, have a desired date or year or age, it makes it more realistic. Yeah. Um, and also it puts more action behind you. Yeah, that definitely agree. agree. And like you said, it makes it more realistic. And I think that's the, 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 again, going back to what motivates someone to to do something and that just helps. All right. So that just about wraps it up. John, Kira, and Kayla, I'd like to thank you for being on today and thank you listeners for tuning in. If anyone has any questions on the topics we covered or any financial area, 
You can schedule a complimentary consultation with us at boutusfinancial.com forward slash call. Thank you for listening to the Agent of Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Boutus Financial. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional financial planning and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investments and financial planning.